fabulous program of the team Bayanian. And uh, today we will have a really, uh, I would say, unique event uh, organized by the uh, Berlin-based institution called uh, Forum Transregionale Studien, but in particular it's a research program called uh, Europe in the Middle East, East in, uh, Middle East in Europe, which is part of this forum. And just several, uh, it's as you see, it's titled Borderlines in the East of Europe. Uh, just a couple of words from uh, uh, from our side as an institutional organizer of the Biennium, why this topic in general emerged within our uh, public programming. Because I have to say that, uh, first of all, that this, uh, this uh, third edition of the Kiev Biennium is uh, conducted as part of the uh, pretty newly established uh, East Europe Biennial Alliance, and I'm also very happy that uh, the representatives of the respective biennials are also present here in the audience. Uh, and um, in particular, also this year it's made with uh, some collaboration with the Biennale Archipelago Mediterraneo in Palermo, which was recently opened. But uh, what we do believe as uh, is that, uh, as kind of at least. Uh, the unprecedented step of establishing this international interbiennial alliance, we think that uh, it should be somehow uh, treated uh, or interpreted as a um, kind of a contraposition in the realm of culture to those uh, ideologically uh, reactionary and regressive uh, political trends which are defining in particular the concurrent conjuncture of the European, Southern and uh, Eastern peripheries, which over the life of the last decade became a battleground for props, proxy wars and the new <coughs> authoritarianism within this kind of uh, pretty often right-wing uh, populist consensus. So uh, what we are trying to do, uh, this uh, kind of a red thread is also present uh, in other biennials of the region. That we are trying to position uh, Eastern Europe together with the Middle East within different uh, geosocial uh, constellations in the current uh, status quo. And that's why we introduced the concept, the new concept called Middle East Europe. This is really very important institutional line of ours, especially with regard to this biennial because uh, it's of course play of words, uh, and this uh, this concept, uh, which basically has this trans-regional merging, uh, we can say that, especially from the Eastern European perspective, it uh, basically opposes the notion of Central Eastern Europe, which is, as we perceive it, is an attempt to erase Easternness as a second-class Europe in order to become more central, more Western, right? It's a part of the current ideological amnesia that we uh, uh, find, find ourselves in. So in this sense, we see it really is a very important uh, and of course challenging task to interconnect these so-called semi-peripheries of the south and the east of Europe in order to reopen their experiences and also emancipatory pro uh, prospects. Mm, and in that regard, of course, the Arab revolutions of 2011 uh, were a very important uh, mark that uh, somehow uh, that we can trace this uh, development of uh, not just confined within the Arab world, but it's also very much interconnected across borders with the movements across the globe, uh, from uh, from the Occupy Wall Street to Europe's Indignados, but also including. Ukrainian uh, Maidan, of course. So today we will have four presentations by researchers from Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria, who are part uh, of this uh, research program of the Forum Transregionale Studien, and I'm really thankful to Rasha Chata, Walid al Khuri, uh, Lamia Mogni, and Rim Nagib for coming here, and especially thankful for George Khalil, who is an academic coordinator of this Forum Transregionale Studien and of the Europe in the Middle East, Middle East in Europe uh, program for organizing this uh, this event here, because uh, this forum Transregional Studien is really a very unique uh, Berlin-based institution, pretty unprecedented one. Well, at least uh, with with regard to uh, to Germany, it's a kind of a, you can say a kind of a intellectual hub for Middle East uh, Middle East studies. Uh, 
uh, in Germany and concentrating uh, fellows and researchers from across uh, the region, but also not only from the Middle East, but uh, also from the Eastern Europe as well. So Georges Khalil was also a coordinator of the working group uh, called Modernity and Islam at the Wissenschaftskollege to Berlin in 1998-2006. Uh, he studied uh, political science, Islamic studies and European studies in Hamburg and Cairo. And I am, the floor is yours and uh, George will present the other speakers of today. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, Vasil. I have to think uh, what to say. We have uh, three hours and a bit more. We will hear here four interventions. Uh, I think uh, you all will tell stories. Um, we met, in, I think, almost exactly four years ago uh, when our first Prisma Ukraina fellow came uh, to Berlin, Natalia Gumenyo. Uh, in relation, uh, we, you, ca you came to the workshop we organized with her on uh, the refugee crisis from Eastern European perspectives was the topic. Actually, the most interesting thing about the workshop was that it was not about uh, refugees, but it was uh, about the rise of identitarian and populist movements in the east of uh, Europe. It is there where we met and we started discussing uh, ideas uh, of how to bring together Eastern European and Middle Eastern uh, perspectives. We had another event in November 2015 with uh, Natalia Gumenyuk. We called it uh, Euro Maidan Tahrir. Natalia wrote a book. Uh, sh I think she, she runs this TV station, Chomatske uh, TV, here in Kiev. So she wrote also a book about the uh, Egyptian revolution that I couldn't read, but we've all found it interesting that an Ukrainian uh, writes uh, a book about the Egyptian revolution um, in a way that makes it relevant uh, to the Ukrainian case. So we, we share this interest in Euro Middle Eastern things. We have also a small sequence of uh, events. We call it sometimes Double East. For example, we made a, a conference uh, in relation to the question of non-Christian religions in Western Europe, which is a problem because uh, uh, the, the way, for example, secularization uh, developed in the German context, developed in a way that uh, was related to the biconfessional situation of Protestantism and Catholicism, for example, in Germany. Uh, Germans had always a problem to accommodate Jews in the framework of the nation state and it led to the major German catastrophe. They also have a problem with accommodating Islam. So we thought uh, Eastern Europe would be a good uh, terrain to compare uh, like the way Jews and Muslims have lived in Eastern Europe. Historically, and I think actually the majority of Muslims uh, lives in Eastern Europe. Perhaps not so many in the Ukraine, but in Russia and Bulgaria and other countries. And of course, uh, uh, Eastern Europe was a home to millions of Jews. <coughs> so we also, that we did in the framework of a program that is called Prisma Ukraina. So Prisma Ukraina is led by a, by a, um, um, by a Ukrainian historian called Andriy Potnov. Um, the idea of it relates to what we call in, in Germany the problem of area studies. I don't know the uh, Ukrainian system enough, uh, whether this is also a, pro a, a problem or an issue in the Ukraine. But in Germany, like I think in most Western European countries, the university system, the modern university system has been set up in the 19th century uh, with universal disciplines like history, literature, religion, the empirical base of philosophy, the empirical basis always was more or less uh, German, French, English, maybe some Italian uh, Renaissance uh, thought. So this forms uh, somehow the basis of the structure of our ways to think universally. But of course, uh, and then the study of other countries, other regions was delegated to area studies like uh, Arabistic, Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies. We also in Germany have Eastern European studies. 
Eastern European studies developed, of course, also in the relation to the Cold War. And it was much focused through the lens uh, of Soviet studies first and later Russian studies. So in a way, that is the point of entry for our Prisma Ukraina uh, project. So the idea to revisit um, Eastern European studies, through, not through the lens of the experience of Russia or the, only of the Soviet Union, but through the prism of the Ukraine and its neighboring uh, regions. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Prisma Ukraina is very similar to our Yumi program. The Yumi program has the Ukrainian colors a bit changed, but that is, <laughs> That was not made up uh, for, for this. Uh, there, the idea is uh, similar. Uh, it addresses uh, this structure problem of area studies. It also uh, addresses uh, the idea of uh, historical leg legacies and of entanglements and, and fragmentations in past and present. So, uh, so in the schizophrenia, because I googled schizo uh, borderlines. Uh, so borderlines, according to Wikipedia, correct me, Lamia, you are the psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, border, borderline or emotionally unstable personality disorder is a mental illness usually characterized by long-term pattern of unstable relationships, a distorted sense of self and strong emotional reactions. Symptoms for borderlines are dis a disturbed sense of identity, you know, this idea of splitting or black and white thinking, uh, anxieties, depression, and, and so on. I think these are all characteristics of our time um, of many societies, not only of the West-East uh, division, uh, of the idea of Europe itself. Uh, I think Ivan Krashtev from Bulgaria, he just published this new book. Uh, it's called uh, The Light Goes Out, some, some title like this. So it's... Uh, it's a reflection about uh, the fading out of the light of the enlightenment. One could also say perhaps that Europe becomes like its others. So this, this kind of anxiety uh, probably um, is more acute uh, today than before uh, in, the use, in, the countries, in, the, in the countries of the European Union, I think half of the states are currently governed by right-wing movements, which are not exactly what uh, we used to think uh, is uh, European, but perhaps it's part of it. It's part of this, uh, uh, this history that was always uh, put uh, or externalizes and now haunts uh, also Western Europe uh, back. I think with this, I come to try to wrap to a bit, a few say a few sentences uh, about uh, the panels. I said in the beginning that there are four pa four interventions. They are all have uh, individual topics. They don't make the argument to explain the world or a total relation. Uh, I may have uh, different opinions about the relation of the four talks than the speakers themselves. <laughs> But I think they are all connected. Uh, they are connected not only because all the four are fellows of our program in Berlin, or have been, um, but I think they all represent um, attempts of uh, reinvestigating, reformulating uh, certain essential ideas about uh, citizenship, about society, about, it, or in a way that is uh, different from um, not only uh, like colonial uh, pre-assumptions or European pre-assumptions about how Easterners are, but also about uh, the narratives of their own uh, nationalistic or patriarchal ways of uh, countering uh, colonial thought that were established in the 20th century. All of them use, I think you don't use history, Walid, but all of them or the others, they use also history, but not in the sense of history, uh, in a conventional uh, way, I think more in the way of uh, of narration. Uh, so, so these narrations all are emancipatory. I think they all relate to something you wrote in your um, in your introduction to the whole program that uh, related to Francis Fukuyama's idea about the end of history. Um, the idea of history, of course, was historically related since the 19th century to the nation state and to progress. And we learned, 
that uh, in the Ukraine you also have national committees for or committees or institutions for the preservation of national history uh, established after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So history, history is a terrain uh, where identity politics are fought out. I think uh, the narratives uh, we will hear uh, try to base the individual experience or the in experience of individuals in the center. Uh, be they women, be they people who were uh, called foreigners or traitors or, or what have you. This quest for new ideas, I think I, I mentioned in my brief uh, introduction to this panel and the program, a few figures I like very much uh, and <laughs> too, and which I observed uh, have a renaissance among many young uh, uh, Arab scholars, people like uh, Georges Hanin, who was a serialist uh, in the Trotskyite in the uh, 30s and 40s, he was an artist, a poet, a translator. He pieces an inspiration for, uh, I think, for um, yeah, succeeding Egyptian generations of uh, young people since, I think, since the late 80s. I studied in Cairo in the 80s and saw the excitement with which uh, some um, people of my age, then Egyptians, discovered uh, these and republished their texts, um, or the texts of this group that was called Art and Freedom and later bread and freedom. And they, for example, argued for in the exhibition they organized in, I think it was in 1933, when Europe was occupied by fascist Germany, they invited the Jews and the, and the opponents of fascism uh, to Egypt and joined them and uh, had this pamphlet, this manifesto, Long Live uh, Degenerated Art. And uh, in his introduction, in his opening speech, uh, uh, said the sentences I wrote also in this um, brief introduction that now the East defends uh, the West or the values of the West. So I find that uh, I think others too find people and uh, persons like that an inspiration for uh, or a call for solidarity that transcends uh, the current uh, uh, boundaries. I think then I'm close to the time period which Reem will uh, deal with. Um, Brim was seen uh, as an Egyptian sociologist. Uh, she took her PhD in, yeah, in sociology uh, in the United States and her MA from the Science Po in Aix-en-Provence. She wrote her dissertation on under the title Intelligentsia Class Formation in Ideologies in Peripheral, in peripheral Society. So yesterday we learned that uh, the Ukraine is also peripheral. It was said yesterday. But, or maybe you said semi-peripheral, but your uh, point of comparison was Egypt and Iran, 1922 uh, to 1952. You were also a postdoctoral fellow of the Arab Council for the Social Sciences. And, uh, are interested in, in your work in the genesis and the development of Egyptian patriarchal nat nationalism, the formulation of the first Egyptian nationality law, and the practice of deporting internationalist foreigners in interwar Egypt. Uh, Rim also uh, writes her dissertation, her new project, uh, into a graphic novel. I think the image that we first saw, she especially drew for our panel. So please, Reem, the floor is yours. So I will talk about connections that were not the work of states or diplomats, uh, but were made up of people struggling against powerful empires, moved by similar political and social ideals, and tied together with networks of solidarity stretching across seas. Um, 
In the late 19th, early 20th century, many people took the maritime road from Odessa to Alexandria for various reasons, uh, to escape poverty, political repression, and anti-Jewish pogroms. Uh, during the revolutionary events in the Russian Empire in 1905, Tsarist repression, compounded with the atrocities committed by the Black Hundreds against Ukrainians, Jews, and revolutionaries, led to a wave of migration from Odessa to Alexandria. Some of the migrants continued towards other destinations, but others settled in Egypt. Egypt offered several advantages, one of which was the capitulations which exempted most European nationals and, um, from taxation and from being subjected to uh, local jurisdiction. And the city of Alexandria especially was attractive because of the economic opportunities it offered as a colonial port city, um, but also uh, due to, the, to, um, due to the, the fact that it was a city of multiple authorities and no hegemon. It was a convenient destination for revolutionaries and political outcasts from Europe. Um, while it was an autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire, it was also under British occupation. And to add to all this, uh, the, the different European consulates uh, exercised authority over their nationals living in the city. So this situation allowed for a degree of political uh, freedom and allowed the, um, the, uh, the political refugees from Europe to, to come to Alexandria for a refuge. Um, as you know, in 1905, the Russian Empire saw vast mobilizations and the formation of grassroots organizations, especially trade unions. In Odessa, virtually every category of worker either established a trade union or tried to form one. Uh, among these were the workers of the commercial vessels of the Azov Black Sea Basin, who were experiencing different, uh, difficult working conditions and, um, and abject poverty, and were receptive to anarcho-syndicalist uh, ideas and movements. Uh, the most prominent union among sea workers in 1906 was the Odessa Registration, or Registratia, and its successor, uh, excuse my pronunciation, uh, and its successor, the Union of Black Sea uh, Sailors. They organized a powerful strike from November 1906 to March 1907, which involved up to 4,000 seamen and workers of port factories to object the reduced salaries uh, and worsening economic uh, worsening working conditions on the Russian society of shipping and trade. Uh, the strike push, pushed the company to make concessions to the workers. However, government repression ensued against anarchist and socialist revolutionary leaders. Some were executed and some were given long prison and exile terms. At that time in Egypt, the Russian diplomatic agency became most preoccupied with the arrival and passage of anarchists and revolutionaries from Russia. Um, already in 1902, Alexandria had served the road for the clandestine transportation of the Social Democrats' publications, especially Iskra, from Western Europe into Russia. And there lived in Alexandria syndicalists from Russia who facilitated this, this road, such as Osip Yusifovich, the owner of the bar Sevastopol, which was situated near the port of Alexandria. Uh, Yusifovich had moved to Alexandria in 1880 and was affiliated with the Bund, or the, the General Jewish Workers' Union of Kherson, and the Russian embassy believed that his bar was a meeting point for socialists and that he personally went on every Russian ship docked at the port to distribute Ill illegal publications. A few years later, Ossetian Mahar Botsoev, known as Mishka, arrived in Egypt. He was one of the most active and well-known anarchists of Odessa a member of the Organizational Committee of the Sailor Strike in the port of Odessa in 1906. He was arrested at the beginning of the strike and was then exiled to, well, he was to be exiled to the province of Arkhangelsk. But Botsoev managed to escape from Russian prison and arrived in Alexandria, where he resumed his organizational activities among the crews of the Russian ships coming from Odessa to Alexandria. Um, the Russian ambassador in Egypt, Alexei Alexandrovich Smirnov, soon wrote to St. Petersburg that um, the sailors of Alexandria have fallen under particularly negative influences since the arrival of Botsuev in Alexandria. The Tsarist authorities wanted to arrest Botsuev, but for what crime? The head of Alexandria police, Hidayat Bek, proposed to implant David Markovich in Botsuev's group. Markovich was an informant, also a Russian Jew from Odessa, who was recruited by the Egyptian secret police to spy on the migrants from Russia. He worked closely with Botsoev's group and gained their trust, 
then held a meeting for them in, the, in his apartment, in which he proposed to, bo to bomb one of the Russian ships, to which, according to Markovich, the group agreed. But the Russian consul in Alexandria, Alexander Nikolaevich Avaza, wrote to Ambassador Smirnov that Markovich has not succeeded yet to make up a case against Botsolev, but he should continue to work from this end, for this end as an agent provocateur, and added that the idea of the bomb did not seem to have been seriously considered by the group. Nevertheless, the Russian consul in Alexandria requested from the Egyptian authorities to arrest Botsolev and two of his comrades, and on January 13th, 1907, the three were arrested in view of their deportation to Russia. The, the arrest of the three syndicalists created an uproar in Alexandria. The Alexandrian French paper, La Réforme, denounced the intention to repatriate uh, political refugees pursued at home due to their political beliefs. The paper called on Alexandrians to defend the three migrants and to save them from the clutch of the notorious Tsarist authorities. These lines were written by the French journalist residing in Alexandria, Raoul Canivet, a founding member and lecturer in the Free Popular University in Alexandria, which had been established five years earlier by Italian anarchists. The Free Popular University would play an active role in organizing the demonstrations that, pro that broke out following the press piece by Canivet. The call resonated among members of the large European population of Alexandria, who embarked on several days on demonstrations. The pro-British English language Egyptian Gazette reported on January 21st, 1907, Alexandria seemed yesterday to be in the very throes of a revolution. A crowd of manifestants made their way to the quay shouting Vive la Liberté and boarded the vessel looking for the prisoners. When the fire brigade was called in, it, it only aggravated the situation. The crowd attacked the fire brigade and did some damage to the engine and hoses. Order was only restored by the arrival of His Excellency the Governor who gave his personal assurance that the prisoners would not be deported before a full inqu inquiry was held into the case. In a letter to the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Smirnov complained, the Jews, the Masons, and the Italian anarchists have caused public disturbances and riots among the European Alexandrians, and that a crowd of 1,000 people tried to attack our consulate and to bring down the shield. The local papers reported that the demonstrators tried to storm the Russian consulate in, sh in search for the prisoners, but the consulate personnel locked, locked themselves in. The demonstrators hurled rotten eggs, mud, onions, and stones at the building, and some of them climbed the tram pole by the side of the entrance and brought down the Tsarist coat of arms. Then the demonstration reached the stock exchange of Alexandria, in front of which, according to El Muayyad, a local paper known for its pro khedevi monarchist uh, inclination, Italian anarchists, angry Armenians, incited Greeks, Ottoman subjects, Jews, and demonstrators from all races and colors listened to a speech by the Jewish Arbib who incited them to strike the next day and to even refrain from eating or, or drinking until the extradition of the prisoners is reversed. El Muayyad, described the demonstrations as, as unprecedented and reported that workers of the mixed labor unions also participated. The mixed labor unions were trade unions that began to include Egyptian workers in their membership and were the cause of great concern among the British colonial administration and the Egyptian elite alike. Uh, that these unions participated in the protests reveals the context in which syndicalists and leftists in Alexandria of various nationalities were trying to unite all workers in Alexandria across ethnic and religious lines. So a delegation of the Alexandrian population called the Committee for the Defense of the Migrant Prisoners submitted a petition signed by 80 people to the city governor demanding the release of the three migrants. The committee also distributed leaflets urging people to resist unlawful practices by the authorities. The number of demonstrators in, in Alexandria was estimated at 5,000. The police cavalry was mobilized to put down the demonstrations and more forces arrived from, arrived from Cairo. Around 100 policemen were charged with guarding the Russian consulate. Several demonstrators were arrested and many injured. And after the dispersal, uh, British troops marched in the streets of Alexandria. Nevertheless, the demonstrations were renewed the next day. They also reached Cairo where protesters gathered in front of the stock exchange and the speech, a speech was given there by an Italian engineer by the name of Patiti. The Egyptian Gazette reports, 
An Italian orator clambered on a table in the bar of the Bourse and protested violently against the arrest of the three Russians. He invited his audience to follow a delegation to the Ministry of Interior, and soon a huge crowd was wending its way down the Sher al-Manech. When the Russian diplomatic agency was reached, the crowd hissed fervently, and the mob then went on to the Russian vice consulate. Mansfield, Field, uh, Mansfield Pesha wanted to disperse the mob and ordered the mountain police to charge. In the disorder that ensued, a police officer is said to have drawn a revolver. He was attacked by the mob, but managed to escape from their fury. Um, the Russian embassy reported that the Italian print workers, who were then in close connection with the Italian anarchists in Egypt, demonstrated. They were joined by a number of Jews and extremist elements. In the afternoon, more people filled the streets. They threatened, whistled, and shouted slogans filled with hate towards Russia. Um, then, a migrant from Russia spoke to the crowd as follows. The present moment is decisive for the life of these three, whom the Russian government is pursuing for political reasons. The bureaucracy demand demands their extradition to then throw them in a dungeon. We, the Russian immigrants in Egypt, demand in the name of humanity that the three prisoners be released from the Alexandrian prison. Because what is called the political crime is, in a social sense, a struggle against Tsarist despotism. Long live freedom, down with the oppression. Another meeting took place in the Continental Hotel in Cairo with more than 200 people. Il Mu'ayd reports that Monsieur Rossi, Petraki, Voronov, and Shalom all spoke, uh, and the committee was formed and headed towards the Russian embassy to meet the ambassador. Um, on their way, a circular was printed in French and distributed in cafes and shops, announcing that the answer of the Russian ambassador will be made public in the Théâtre des Nouveautés at 6 p.m. The newspaper reports with surprise that before 6 p.m. there gathered a very large crowd in front of Théâtre des Nouveautés to the extent of filling and exceeding the capacity of the theater. In the theater, a legal memorandum was drafted by Shalom and Rossi, and the delegation was formed to meet with Lord Cromer, the then British agent and consul in Egypt, to request him to clarify what are the charges and evidences brought against the three Russians. A British report recounted the third day of demonstrations where speakers talked of freedom, humanism, and solidarity. They sang the Internationale and the Inno dei Lavoratori, or the Italian Hymn of the Workers. Um, responding to criticism, the British agency argued that the Egyptian government had no other choice under the capitulations but to surrender the Russian nas nationals to Russia. British officials argued that they would be violating international law if they were to grant asylum to European political refugees. This at a time when Britain strictly upheld the right of asylum for political refugees in the metropole um, and had not deported any migrant, but had hardly begun to regulate the influx of migrants into Britain with a new legislation called the Alien Act in 1905. The Alien Act nevertheless made an exception in cases of migrants at risk in their home countries seeking asylum in Britain. On the other hand, um, on the one hand, British officials had been dismayed by the limits of their to their authority in Egypt that the capitulations posed uh, and used the incident to, to blame the extradition on the commitments that Egypt had towards European states. El Mu'ayyad even accused um, or, or insinuated that the events were put up by the British authorities to get rid of the capitulation. But on the other hand, the capitulations were useful for British colonialism. They justified the occupation, as Britain claimed to be protecting European interests in Egypt. But most importantly, they served well the British desire to keep the colony free of European radicals, out of fear that they radicalized the local population. The, the capitulations allowed Britain to give a legal legitimation to ideological deportation of politically active European residents. While the capitulations gave advantages to European nationals and reinforced colonial relations of power and inequality vis-à-vis -vis the local population, the British authorities were able to use them against some undesirable Europeans, namely those who upheld socialist and democratic ideals and were active at disseminating them among Europeans and Egyptians alike. So the Russian embassy lodged complaints against the ring leaders of the demonstrations at the consulates on which they depended. Canivet was summoned for interrogation over his role in instigating the events, and the French ambassador Klobukovsky even promised Smirnov that in case Canivet is proven guilty, he does not mind at all his expulsion from Egypt. The Austrian consulate in Alexandria also held a trial for the Austrian national Alfred Campus, accused of leading the demonstrations around the Russian consulate. 
a British subject, William Patrick Foley, was summoned by the British agency. The Alexandria City Police accused him of being at the head of, demonstrat of the demonstrators and of having encouraged them, and he was sentenced to two months imprisonment. Greeks and Armenians did not enjoy capital capitulatory status, so several of them were tr ti uh, tried by the native courts. They included someone called Herkin Alexian Tristian, Armenian tailor, age 24, and two Greek Ottoman subjects, Dimitri Astarati, shoemaker, age 19, Manoli Germani, a barman, along with 10 others who may have included Egyptians. They were all accused of contempt toward His Excellency the Tsar of Russia, and to the Russian imperial coat of arms. Um, they were each sentenced to five months in prison. So contrary to the colonialist and nationalist conservative press who justified the extraditions on legal terms or by depicting the three Russians as terrorists, some evidence shows that the demonstrators could rely on a level of solidarity among Egyptians. So a call was published in the Arabic language Al-Ahram, the most widely read among uh, locals, calling on Arabic-speaking comrades to defend the victims of such injustice in order for freedom and humanity to prevail. We must each be ready for more work and to meet force with force if necessary. Long live the Russian people, down with the monarchy. So that was published in Al-Ahram. Um, moreover, the most authoritative nationalist newspaper at the time, al denounced the unfavorable coverage in al muayyid which had thanked God that there were absolutely no Egyptians or Muslims in the demonstrations. Liwe argued that this was equivalent to thanking God for the death of sentiments among Muslim citizens. In truth, any free Egyptian patriot must cry tears of blood to see that there is no Muslim presence in these demonstrations. Il Muayyad should have urged the Muslim population of Egypt to participate in these demonstrations. Um, at the end, however, the Solidarity Movement failed to thwart the extraditions. Um, while the demonstrators were occupying the docks of Alexandria and surrounding the Russian ships, the Russian authorities secretly transported the prisoners to Port Said. The Egyptian government provided a special train for the purpose with an officer of the Alexandria City Police and 20 Russian detectives on board. In Port Said, the Russian ship Kornilov was waiting at the port under steam and the prisoners were put on board and embarked immediately back to Odessa. As a gesture of gratitude to the British officials who helped carry out the extraditions, the Russian embassy granted the British Commandant of the Alexandria City Police, the British Director of the Egyptian Secret Police, and the British Director of Al-Hadra Prison, the Order of St. Anna. A pompous ceremony was also held to restore the coat of arms above the door of the Russian consulate, attended by British and e Egyptian officials in full uniform, and the police band performed as they restored the coat of arms to the entrance. Now, a similar event happened uh, in 1913, in the aftermath of the attempt to renew the activities of the Trade Union of the Black Sea Sailors in Odessa. Due to government repression, it was decided in 1912 to move the Union leadership outside the Russian Empire, first to Constantinople, where the sailors' monthly Moriak uh, began publication, until the Balkan War broke out and the Union's committee moved to Alexandria. Moriak began to be printed in the Cairo district of Helwan. Alexandria was a strategic port for the sailors since Russian ships from the seas of Europe and the Far East passed through its port. Therefore, the idea arose to work on establishing a unified union of all Russian sailors. The Alexandria Committee coordinated with the Caspian Union of Sailors, the Baltic ship crews, as well as unions based in Rotterdam, Antwerp, Hull, Marseille, Constantinople, Constanta, and Galati. Relations were established with steamboats to distribute Moriac to the ports of South America and Philadelphia, where Russian immigrant sailors settled, and with the steamships of the East Asian society, the newspaper went as far as Vladivostok. Uh, so the renewed movement had a wider international reach, uh, as well as a larger reach, uh, reach across the Russian Empire. So in Alexandria, the Russian authorities grew alarmed again, especially that in February 1913, the Union of the Black Sea Sailors, which by that time had consolidated the membership of 2,000 sailors of 84 merchant ships, organized in Alexandria the first conference of all Russian maritime organizations and began to plan for a large-scale strike to take place in the spring of 1913. Leading the committee in Alexandria and editing its organ, Moriak, was Mikhail Adamovich. Adamovich had been the head of the first union of the sailors, Registratia, in 1906. 
1912, he participated in the strike of the crews of the merchant ships in Odessa, was arrested and jailed for a year, then acquitted, and moved to Constantinople, then to Alexandria, with the leadership committee of the Black Sea Sailors Union abroad. Once in Alexandria, he carried on with his union activities and the publishing and distribution of Moriak. But Adamovich had not broken any law in Egypt, and it would have been proven difficult to make up a case of intended sabotage against Adam Adamovich um, and the new leadership of the Black Sea sailors in Alexandria, as they rejected economic terrorism, which was a popular tactic among anarchists in 1906. In one of his letters to the Viennese Pravda, Adamovich noted that he had succeeded in persuading the sailors of the necessity that the forthcoming strike be carried out without violence. Um, but this time, British, the British were more than ready to cooperate, with or without proving Adamovich's guilt. They were already worried about the influence of anarchists, syndicalists, and socialists on the Egyptian population. Smirnov reported in January 1913 that the chief of the local police told him that he was amazed at the power and speed with which anarchist teachings were spreading in Egypt. So Smirnov secured the help of the British Egyptian authorities again and headed to Alexandria on May 8, 1913 to attend the arrest of Adam Adamovich in person. When it was found out that Adam Adamovich possessed a German passport, the Egyptian authorities required the permission of the German consulate, which the Derm German consulate granted immediately, and Adamovich was arrested and put in Al-Hadra prison, along with Chersky and Mas Maslov. The arrest of Adamovich prompted another wave of anger and solidarity in, e in Egypt, similar to the one that happened six years earlier. Again, a European journalist residing in Egypt, this time Sidney Mosley, the editor of the Egyptian Daily Mail, helped publicize the, the Adamovich case, referring to the activities of Tsarist agents in Egypt as a most intolerable, intolerable campaign of tyranny, and stating that Russian secret police lured innocent men to their doom with the cunning plausibility which belongs only to the Russian secret police. Adamovich's girlfriend, Ekaterina Tripe, connected local anarchists, and one of whom translated the message of Adamovich, which he wrote in prison into which he which he wrote in prison into English, and sent it to London, where it reached the press and the labor unions. She also put down a plan to help Adamovich escape from detention. It was it was arranged for him to jump over the the, the prison wall, uh, and they put a bicycle uh, by the wall for him to to pedal as soon as he jumps, but he broke his leg and unfortunately was rearrested. So um, Alexandrian leftists and syndicalists demonstrated again, and sailors at the port rallied and threatened reprisal against Smirnov. Smirnov wrote to St. Petersburg that the socialists and members of the labor groupings in Alexandria intended to prevent the extradition through the mobilization of demonstrators, the attempt to release the prisoners, and even through death threats to the diplomatic agency. Um, the Russian, British, and Egyptian authorities in Egypt therefore resorted to trickery. One hour prior to the scheduled departure of the steamer that will carry the prisoners from the port of Alexandria, the three deportees were uh, brought in a truck to the customs office at the port. At first, the ship sailed without the prisoners, then the prisoners were transported to the ship at sea by means of a small boat of the customs authorities. Apparently, Ekaterina and several other uh, comrades attempted to intercept the boat, <coughs> but were prevented by the police. Another account says that the prisoners were put in a wooden box hidden under piles of coal on the Russian ship. So the authorities seemed to fear the power of the sailors and the sympathizers with Adamovich. His transfer was guarded by an officer and 15 soldiers of the 50th Bialystok Infantry reg Regiment. And from Con Constantinople, the chief of the Odessa Police Department accompanied the arrested men into Russian waters with a convoy of two torpedo boats. They reached Odessa on June 4, 1913. The Odessa city authorities also increased police presence in the port to prevent possible sailors' protests. After 18 months spent in Russian jail, the deportees stood trial along with 67 others. Adamovich was sentenced to life banishment in Siberia. It is believed that the leadership of the sailors' union were not executed due to requests by the British to the Russian government under pressure from labor unions in Britain. Adamovich's letter was reprinted by the entire labor union press of England and further throughout Europe and caused an uproar in public opinion. The English Labour Party instigated an inquiry in Parliament to determine why the British government had surrendered Adamovich to Russia. Um, British Minister of Foreign Affairs, Edward Gray, 
Cromer and Kitchener, the then proconsul of Egypt, all blamed the capitulations again. They even went further. Both Cromer and Gray argued that the question of whether Adamovich had committed a crime or not was irrelevant um, to the commitment to head him over, according to the capitulations. And he wrote, the legal obligation of the Egyptian government would have been precisely the same if he had been accused of no offense at all. But the legality of the extradition, even under the capitulations, were refuted in the British press. And so was Kitchener's argument that it was a long-standing practice. Objections in the press and in the labor union statements and appeals referred to the example of the refusal of Britain to surrender the young Turks to the Ottoman regime or the refusal to hand in to the Hungarian state the revolutionary Kossuth. Uh, most importantly, Gray stated in Parliament that the existing treaty concerning the non-surrender of political prisoners was in force only in England proper and did not extend to her territories. And Cromer concluded that a country which is not indeed British territory, but which is held by British garrison and in which British influence is predominant, affords no safe asylum for a political refugee, meaning Egypt. Um, so uh, it is true that Britain was moved partly by her desire to, this is a very confusing picture, right? It is King George V with King Nicholas II, they are cousins. They look like twin brothers. <laughs> so, um, so it is true that Britain was moved by her desire not to cause diplomatic strain with Russia, but it is likely that even if it were not for that, the requirements of colonial control would have been in contradiction with the insurance of the right of asylum for political refugees in the colonies. What Gray and Cromer expressed indicates that the exception of colonial territories from pr the prerogatives of providing sanctuary is intrinsic to colonialism as the preoccupation with ensuring the docility and isolation of the colonized populations makes the presence of internationalist revolutionaries undesirable in the colonies. It is an example of the colonial rule of difference. It was the internationalist character of socialist and anarchist movements of the early 20th century, their cutting across ethnic and religious divides that worried colonial empires. In Egypt, it was a time when Egyptians were beginning to establish class-based solidarity with European workers, and the revolutionary spirit was forming, which would burst in 1919 into mass mobilizations across the country, not only against colonial rule, but against exploitation by landowners and factory owners. So my other research or the rest of my research shows how this fear of the spread of radicalism in the colonies led to a colonial policy of ideological deportations of a large number of European syndicalists and socialists after the First World War, especially, and set important precedences and legal legitimation for the practice of deportation, extradition, and even denaturalization based on political beliefs by the Egyptian state following independence and to the present day. Thank you. How would you relate the stories of deportations and so on to the current situation of uh, imprisonment, um, the questions of um, questions of solidarity and protest and so on that are posed in Egypt today? Do you think about that in mind when you go back to the historical narratives? Also, how the nationalist narrative is mobilized um, 
as a way to, to, as a way, uh, to uh, suppress uh, uh, international solidarity that could be revolutionary, that has a revolutionary potential. So there's always this going back to the a very conservative totalitarian nationalist narrative uh, to suppress these. And this happened after 2011. Uh, along with you know, a discourse that is very xenophobic, um, um, as if you know, being Egyptian was one thing and it was uh, very refined and, um, and almost ethnic too. I mean, it's also a, a racist uh, um, definition of uh, nationhood that always comes back, especially following uh, uh, mass mobilizations and revolutionary moments. And that's what happened in the 1920s. Um, so because 1919 was so revolutionary and, it's, and it didn't only scare the, the British uh, colonial administration, but also the, the economic and political elite who were trying to replace the colonizers and to Egyptianize the state and to just be the new nationalist and nationalist elite uh, replacing the British, but they also tried to, um, to keep the, 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 the current social structure and social inequalities as they are. And so we, we see that just after the first uh, parliamentary elections in 1924 and the first constitution, it was the new political elite that is considered national, the Wasps, that carried out these deportations. And, and it's so uh, ironic because some of the people who were deported, who, who started like the first socialist uh, movement in Egypt and the first syndicates, especially mid syndicates, some of them uh, were, were, were deported, but they had no place to go to because they were Europeans living in the Ottoman Empire and then there was no longer an Ottoman Empire. And then, okay, what to do with those? Uh, uh, so, it, it becomes tricky for the Egyptian government. Uh, and a few examples uh, were ended in complete failure. They don't know where to, to take them. One of them is actually um, originally from, um, from the tale of settlement in Ukraine. Like uh, uh, Rosenthal is a, is a Russian Jew, but uh, he, he was born actually in Palestine and settled, and that's why he was an Ottoman subject when he came to Egypt in 1899. And he's the one who established the first Communist Party and the first uh, mixed labor union in 1921. And they tried to deport him, and there is a very ironic, funny story that is good material for a graphic novel of you know going around the ports of the Mediterranean trying to find a country that would take him, but he has no nationality. <laughs> so here, I, I am sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You can spare your questions for a later <laughs> round. So the next speaker is, thank you, Nadine. Next speaker is uh, Rasha Shatta. She will talk on contact zones, border crossings, border lines, figuring the refugee in graphic narratives. Uh, since 2017, she is with us in Berlin as a, as a fellow of our UMI program, working on a book project on Ar Arab comics, uh, entitled until now, a comparative study of immigrant stories, war narratives, She has a proposal PhD in cultural history, post-colonial studies, and so on and so on. So please, Sasha, the floor is yours. Oh, it's too early. Hi everyone, um, I would just like to first um, thank Vasil for inviting us um, and um, for inviting us to participate in this Biennale and for the opportunity to um, engage with you on some of the works, um, we, we, some of the topics we work on. Um, so my talk is titled Contact Zones, uh, Border Crossings, Border Lines, Figuring the Refugee in Graphic Narratives. So I guess um, many of you know um, that the past uh, eight years or so have witnessed unparalleled levels of human displacement and migratory movement um, of an unprecedented uh, magnitude in and from the region I work on, which we commonly refer to as the Middle East. 
So, um, in my current research, I'm looking at um, how the genre of comics, or more generally what uh, we call as graphic narratives, so um, um, stories that are made of visual elements and written um, elements, how these um, graphic narratives that are addressed to an adult audience um, have emerged forcefully and mushroomed in um, the Arab world from 2010 onwards. And I argue that um, this is intrinsically linked to um, the emergence of a space during and after which um, we have seen waves of social and political um, protests that have swept the region and to which we refer to as uh, commonly the Arab Spring or the Arab Revolution. Okay, <clears throat> so um, these are some of the, the comics collectives that were form formed um, in the wake of, of these um, revolutions, but also before. So um, they're usually collectives because a lot of uh, young uh, illustrators and comics artists come together. They establish networks of solidarity, workshops, and also publish magazines such as the ones you see here. So I don't really want to go into too much detail, but um, I just want to say that um, uh, situations of conflict and the realities of conflict have tended to offer some of the major defining and thematically recurrent treatments in the various graphic narratives. So what we see really is uh, an integral relation between um, conflict, uh, I mean the rise of this genre, and situations of conflict or social upheaval. So conflict and migration as a natural correlatives are not just themes in the works, but they also represent indexes to the rise and the developments of the genre. So here I'll just show you a few of these um, initiatives that were uh, made. So the first one to the left is Asamandel, and this is a bit of an exception in the region. It was founded in 2007 in Lebanon, and very much played a precursor role for what emerged afterwards. Um, to the right, you have Tok Tok, which was uh, published in 2011 in Egypt. Um, and other such magazines you have here, um, Masaha in Iraq, Garage in Egypt, Skepskef in Morocco, and Lab 619 um, in Tunisia, and there are many, many more. This is just a, a quick overview. So to show you a little bit the relationship between um, conflict and migration, this is um, an excerpt I've chosen. Um, to show you, which was published by an Egyptian uh, comics artist in a Tunisian uh, comics magazine called Lab 619, which had devoted a special issue to migration. So this here you can see is a quite a simple streamlined stories where actually um, it's very much relying on the contrast of colors. So in black and white, um, events from the past, you can obviously see it's someone who is on a boat um, crossing, we guess, uh, maybe a, a sea getting somewhere. So reflecting on his past life, which is drawn in black and white, and then um, these um, colored panels, where there's this very strong contrast of the orange of the life jacket that, that emerges. So you can see also in black and, and white, the destruction of the city, war, and family portraits that then um, disappear. So, so for my talk today, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit, and I want to talk um, a bit more in depth about um, the impact of uh, graphic narratives that are specifically dealing with displacement and migration, and by exten extension on borders and borderlines. So I'm going to focus on something a bit more distinct, it's a distinct subgenre, which is the testimonial or the reportage comics uh, written by comics authors that are based outside the region, so whether in Europe or in the US, and who write, draw, and tell stories on behalf of the individuals or families that they have met along these um, in the past eight years. So usually what we see um, emerging commonly are a treatment of uh, common themes, um, like the circumstances, the context of the displacement, the reasons for leaving, and key moments, such as um, the life in the host country, some issues of discrimination, legal issues, and opportunities that are presented. So I'm interested in asking, how do we frame um, graphic narratives of displacement 
as a critical tool that can also challenge uh, perhaps set norms. How can these visual narratives embedded in the context of past or current wars and migration contribute to the ongoing debates on migration in the West? How can this particular genre lend its form to the articulation of voice and uniqueness of experience? And finally, what do these creative accounts tell us about personal stories in the face of the collective? So I will just um, start by saying that I'm sure everyone knows that the testimonial or what we call the reportage comics are not really a new phenomena that has emerged with the, the, uh, these revolutions, but that we have a precedent. So you might think of um, Art Spiegelman's um, seminal work, Mouse, which depicts um, Spiegelman's uh, father's experience as a Polish Jew, um, and you already know that he represents a, like the, the mice characters. Um, but for the reportage comics, there is also, um, or actually sometimes it's called comic, comic journalism, so it depends. It's, um, uh, one is reminded by um, Joe Sacco's uh, stories of war-torn countries, such as his uh, works on Palestine, Bosnia, or other places which have very much paved the way um, for, the, for the field. So this uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, there is a very long tradition of Franco-Belgian bande dessinée or comic strips, which means that there already was an established uh, platform to, to publish these graphic narratives um, that mix historical uh, events with personal testimonies, and this is what we're gonna see now. So um, in France alone, for example, there you have a lot of um, graphic narratives that have emerged in recent years that talk about a particular historical event, but from a very personal point of view. So here I'll just um, cite a few to give you um, some ideas. So you have Al um, Veli by Toulouse, the one on the top um, left, which was published in 2015 and which uh, recounts the author's grandparents' forced migration to Greece alongside uh, 1.5 million uh, Greeks that were living in Asia Minor in the 1920s. So this is also the theme of the one in the center bottom uh, by Alain Glicos, an author uh, uh, Manolis, so which also treats of, at this time, Glicos' father uh, expulsion from Asia Minor and his long journey uh, that ended up in the city of Marseille in, in the south. So other topics here I've just um, uh, very selectively uh, chosen to show you are for example um, the remembrance of uh, the Armenian genocide which is the case of everything else that's left. Um, so Le uh, um, um the, the Armenian ghost of Fontana Armenia and Varto by Golnein and Stefan Torosian. These were published mostly in 2015, uh, which marked the centenary of the, of the Armenian, of the remembrance of the Armenian genocide. So these are just, I've just chosen um, to show you about uh, the, the <coughs> uh, Greeks of Asia Minor and Armenian genocide, but you also can think about other such um, events that are related. So we can think about the the descendants of uh, the Algerian war, for example. So you have a lot of descendants of people who fought uh, alongside the, the resistance front, the FLN, or who were the descendants of the French colonizers who attempt to reconcile the story of their parents, their grandparents, with these larger um, historical narratives. So all of this to say that um, testimonial and reportage comics are gaining terrain within the comic scene because of the search for more real stories, rather than facts and fiction, and this is pushing comic, comics authors into fields that they had seldom um, looked at. So they are pushed to report, investigate on important issues, and to think about translating them into a more graphic narrative voice. So in the same vein, and what I will focus on for, for my analysis uh, now, has been triggered by the revolution and the war in Syria and the subsequent uh, demographic shifts and human losses that have ensued. So I've counted up to today about 15 titles, one five, graphic narratives that deal with um, this topic alone. So I of course don't have the time here to go over all of them, but I'll just mention a few and then I've selected three to, 
to show you how, how these works um, work and we can analyze them. So these are accounts that are published in France, in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in Denmark, and, and elsewhere. So um, the first one that you see on the left, um, Kobane Calling, was published in 2016 by an Italian journalist, Zero Calcare, who was sent by um, the newspaper he worked for, so this is a leftist uh, publication, the Internazionale, uh, he was sent to the front lines of uh, the Kurdish region, region that's sometimes referred to as, uh, as Rojava, and most specifically on um, Kobane, the city of Kobane, at a time where it was facing severe attacks by uh, uh, Daesh or, uh, or ISIS, actually. So he's sent there, and um, he reports, sends one-page uh, stories or vignettes to the newspaper, and it is met with great success. So much so that this is then transformed into, uh, uh, published into a graphic uh, novel and actually republished twice. So he reports really with, with sarcasm, with black humor, with bitterness, with sadness about wh what is happening. And this was important at the time because it was filling in some sort of gap that, uh, that perhaps we weren't able to find information about elsewhere. So, um, you can see here, I don't know if, you, if the images are clear, but you can see that he really attempts to uh, provide a map to explain what is at stake in this conflict, who is fighting who and what's happening. Um, so I can also mention the work of um, uh, Olivier Kugler, who is a German uh, comics author, which comes a um, bit in a different uh, initiative, but actually quite similar. He was commissioned by Doctors Without Borders in 2013 to go to a refugee camp, first in Domiz, in the Iraqi Kurdistan, and then he follows the trail of um, the trail of the migrants that are coming from the Near East. So he has stories in the Iraqi Kurdistan, then he moves to Greece, France, and England, and Germany, and he creates uh, drawings that very much document the life of Syrian refugees there. Um, so again, this was met with great success and published under the title Escaping Wars and Waves in 2018. The style is a little bit different from what we saw before. There aren't really stories, so it's a one page focusing on one character or a family drawn in their local setting, in a tent, in um, wherever they happen to be, and giving us just bribes of information, where they came from, how they arrived, where they are, and how life is. And it's very short, usually. Um, Kate Evans' uh, Threats of the Refugee Crisis to the right uh, is an account of, uh, of her account, sorry, meeting asylum seekers in the jungle of, of Calais in, in France, France just before it shut down in 2017. So she shows how the dispossessed and the displaced um, uh, like their, their acts of uh, protesting against certain conditions um, and uh, her, th their rage, she really becomes a medium for them, like a vehicle to, to voice their difficulty, difficult sorry, conditions, their plight. And this is very interesting because she was also, she had a column in the British newspaper, The Guardian, and then this was also made into a book, but she's one of the very few, I think this is uh, worth mentioning, that um, very much reflect on her own positionality. I mean, there was a surge of journalists going into the jungle of Calais and writing very sensationalist uh, stories and participating in this dislification of, of Calais or, or, or other camps, whereas she's really always reflecting on where she comes from and what her role plays in this, in this particular setting. And in the book, she also shows um, these texts that she's being sent by anti-immigration um, anti people who tell her that you know, you're giving voice to people who does, don't deserve to be here. So there's always this kind of um, back and forth between the realities of, uh, of uh, the situation about migrants and what is happening in the camp. Then you have Don Brown in the middle, uh, The Unwanted Stories of, of the Syrian Refugees, which was published in 2018. And this is, again, a very, very different enterprise. What he wants to do, he's an American uh, comics uh, author, is very simple. He is much more um, uh, willing to give, to provide 
their information, numbers, what happens, uh, weaving together very short vignettes. So, so he doesn't focus necessarily on uh, at one character or a family, but um, he has this very scientific endeavor of providing facts and actually you can find a big bibliography at the end of the book with sources, it's very meticulously done uh, in a very spare style as a way of presenting a, a wide collectivity of voices. So here, for example, you can see, um, you can see uh, I mean, I, I didn't put it here, but you can see elsewhere uh, some images of uh, overloaded boats uh, with people tipping off of them. Um, it's also really meant to be a pedagogical tool and it includes, uh, as I said, a bibliography. So it's meant also as a teaching tool um, in the classroom. Um, I mean, the font is too small for you to read, I apologize, you know, it's big on my screen. But uh, it basically just says in very simple uh, sentences, if I remember collect correctly, that borders uh, were open, um, migrants came, borders are shut, and now they're blocked on the borderline, and what do we do now? Where, where do we go from there? Okay, and um, to, to the left is uh, Brothers of the Gun, a memoir of the, of the Civil War. And this was uh, quite an unusual um, initiative. It was a collaboration between uh, an American journalist, Molly Krababu, who met on Twitter uh, a, a Syrian activist in the city of, from the city of Raqqa, uh, which then infamously became uh, known as being the capital of the Islamic uh, Caliphate. So this was also at a time where uh, ISIS w uh, was actually uh, arriving and establishing its, its capital. So, um, and there was really a blackout of news at the time. We didn't know what was happening. I mean, unless you're a local and you know which activists to follow, but I think for, a, for an external, for a more Western audience, it was more difficult perhaps to follow what was happening on the ground. So what he would do was to send her uh, photos, like real ph photographs, that he took uh, surreptitiously and to send them to her along with some stories that he had witnessed. And she would rework these photographs. I think it's quite clear if you, if you look at it that it, there's something a bit of a of photographs that is blurred or made into a black and white. So, um, so um, oh yeah, I forgot to say that they were published in Vanity Fair first and then elsewhere. So it showed, showed really things that we would not see otherwise. And, um, and she, I think what this um, really contributed to was to be able to follow how the city of Raqqa was altering day by day and how ISIS was occupying more and more space. And you were, you were really able to see this through, through the accounts of, uh, of um, Krababul and uh, and uh, Sham. So um, the, this endeavor of, of collecting uh, stories of people waiting for the unknown and giving them names and drawing their faces very much contrasts with usual images of thousands of people on the move uh, in a mass-like form. So these comics, comic authors are narrating the stories of thousands of people coming out of history books, really, and that are perishing in the Mediterranean or elsewhere and are being stopped at borders and at borderlines. And I think that the, the act, the very act of naming constitutes it is really a humanizing act. So it's a way of giving them a longer span of life and ensuring that they're not being immediately forgotten, anonymized as a collective form. I think there's also a lot to be asked, maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A. Um, there's a lot to be asked of this genre vis-a-vis -vis more conventional media type, for example, um, uh, sources. So I mean, we saw this at its peak in 2015, with the example of Raqqa, perhaps, also uh, Rojava, but uh, we also continue to see them today. These um, unbearable images of people on the move, of people drowning in the sea, but perhaps um, graphic narratives in the forms that I've shown you are able to succeed in delivering the image in a much more effective way. And there's, I think, a much wider, deeper, broader space to look at the human range of, of emotions and experiences. So in a sense, you get um, this dimension of real life um, narrative that perhaps we're missing in the media, and this is an open question, I, I don't have an answer. So, Crabapple, Evans, and Kugler's respective works were all very, very well received and welcomed by mainstream readership. So, what they're engaged drawing in activism, because we can't call it an activist act, I think, uh, 
and uh, <laughs> as yesterday's speaker <laughs> said. Um, so the, the, their activism, to a certain extent, did was to provide a, a platform for other voices to be heard and seen with just enough mediation to arrive to, to the kind of crowd or readership that, that we would be interested in. So these subjective, immediate testimonies recall what um, Jillian Whitlow qualifies as um, soft weapon, um, to talk about writings on the war that have to do more with war or displacement as lived experience, rather than um, uh, as an abstract event. And the testimonial aspect, to a certain degree, is precisely where the personal and the collective um, intersect. So with what little time is left, uh, I want to quickly analyze just three recent, but very different examples of graphic novels that deal specifically with the Syrian refugees, and that look, um, and we can look at the different uh, ways of storytelling and, and artistic um, techniques. Okay. Um, so um, this is uh, a work by Alain Glicos, who I mentioned earlier, the same person who is a descendant of a Greek refugee from the 1920s. Uh, so he's the, he wrote the story, and Antoine Noir is the illustrator. It's called um, Life Jackets, Gilet de Sauvetage, and it was published in 2018. So um, you can see in the middle panel, actually, it's very interesting because um, Glicos is really someone who's haunted by, by his father and by his background, his historical background. So he thinks of himself as the descendant of a Greek refugee, someone who moved many times, actually, to finally arrive to the city of Marseille. And he can only think of the Syrian crisis that's happening uh, on the, sh I mean, uh, in his, not really home country, but original country, um, as some sort of continuity. So he travels to the island of Hios and, um, and is faced all the time with, with stories of refugees arriving. And um, you can see in the middle panel this evolution. I don't know if you can see. Okay. You can see uh, Kios, the first one, it says Kios 1822, Smyrna uh, 1922, and Damascus 2015. So always inscribing these waves of migration in something larger and that uh, resonate, have this universal resonance. So um, uh, you can see that uh, here also it provides maps showing, uh, showing these diff different movements of Syrian migrants. And on the left panel, actually, he's showing a scene of a Syrian uh, asylum seeker, seeker that's being beaten up. Um, but the text doesn't correspond, actually, to what, we, what we're seeing. In the text, he's talking about the experience of his own father. So there's always this echo of what, what happened to my father in a universe by the text. Um, so sometimes he uses um, also, uh, you can see the recurrence of the life jacket again. I mean, but uh, he uses real photos that he took and blurs them, like this one here and the one on the right. And um, um, yeah, it's the, the account is full of, of life jackets, of masses, of black masses with, with orange life jackets. Okay, this is um, a completely different kind of work. Uh, it's the Odyssey of, of Hakim. Uh, which was published in 2018. This is the first volume. I think the second one came, came out two months ago in the summer. And um, it's very voluminous, it's quite big, and it's a, a beautiful book. I mean, if you had to read one, I would recommend this one. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's, it starts with the, with the author, you know, um, talking about uh, why, why is he doing this kind of work? Why is he talk, talking about the Syrian refugees? He's French, he lives in France, he worked on very different topics before. And he starts by saying that, okay, um, in 2015, when some of you may remember, there was a voluntary crash of an airplane, uh, I think the German wings, um, like, um, I think the pilot was suicidal and, and uh, hundreds of people died he felt a lot of uh, compassion towards these people. But at the same time, the same week, there was a boat that was drowning with um, asylum seekers, actually much greater uh, numbers, and he wasn't able to relate to them. So he really starts by asking, uh, why, why do I feel more compassion with hundreds of people who died in an airplane 
than with huge numbers of people that are perishing in the sea every day. So, um, so he asks, is it, is it the reoccurrence of these events that has led us to become accustomed to these tragedies? So it's really, he's moved by the desire to understand and he meets a, a Syrian refugee called Hakim to understand how these migrants, uh, how, how they've pursued their life and how they've arrived um, to where they are. So Hakim is a 30-year-old Syrian refugee who's living in Aix-en-Provence in the south uh, with his wife and his children since 2015. Stories differ, backgrounds differ, and individual stories are, are very, um, have very different paths and ending. So, um, going back to Hakim, so he was arrested, his, um, uh, the uh, eldest son uh, in his family was arrested and thrown in jail, and it's an odyssey because he's been, he left Syria, went to uh, Lebanon, then to Jordan, then to uh, Turkey, and then finally to France. And he manages to follow him in each of these steps. And you can see that the way he does this is to use different colors. So um, the, the ones with the yellowish background are based in the past, whereas the ones in blue are based, sorry, the opposite. No, the ones in blue are, are, based, are based in the in the present, and the ones with the yellowish uh, background are based in the past. So you can really see through his eyes what, what's happening. Um, with these effects of zooming in through his eyes. Okay. No, no, I'm not done, I'm not done. <laughs> so, um, I think also he really includes um, um, things that you may all um, recognize, the photo of the, the child island that was found on the shores in Turkey. Um, and he's, I mean, really, Beautiful, simple things like a plant, which represents the refugees that are unrooted, that continue to to grow, but with a bit more difficulty elsewhere. And I'll just end on one last example, which is Zenobia, uh, by two Danish um, authors, Morten Dor and Lars Hornman. Um, so it was uh, published in 2017 in Danish and then translated uh, in 2018 into English. And uh, it won um, the Danish National Illustration Award in 2017. And this is perhaps one of the most simple accounts, but it's also because it's so simple, it's also very powerful. So it's a very, very simple narrative. Um, um, and the first page is open on, on a little girl that is falling off this boat. Um, so you have effects of zooming in, so you see the boat, then you approach more, then the wave is throwing everybody off the boat, and she falls into the sea. And while she's falling, she's drowning. You just have small sentences of her remembering things, and her favorite game was to hide and seek. So the one sentence that is re recurrent in the whole thread is, now nobody will be able to find me. Okay, so she says it's empty here and now nobody will find me, I think, because I can't see, but something along those lines. So, um, this is, these are the flashbacks that she has also. So it says we used to, our favorite game was hide and, and peek. And uh, he also, they also provide uh, images of war torn stories and of, of airplanes bombing the uh, the city. So these are kind of flashbacks. So um, I think it's uh, it's one of the most um, aesthetically pure works that that I could found find in within these like fifteen titles. Um, but it's actually apparently it's going to be again re reprinted because of the great demand for it. So I think I'm a bit over time. So I just I'll just very quickly conclude by saying that uh, graphic narratives allow, um, allow a form of democratization of the voice and of direct accessibility to personal experiences, discerning memories and representability. Um, graphic stories that focus on war, on memory, on migration, uh, they problematize and uh, complicate perhaps more official and widely circulated narratives. And they are able to offer alternative, more democratic, and accessible ways of dealing with complex contemporary historical moments and these kind of emergent global realities. 
and they remain an important vehicle um, to convey the modern narratives of displacement and loss and dislocation today, uh, precisely because they lay bare the, the full human cost of tragedy. Thank you. Thank you everyone and thank you Vasil for the invitation. Um, this, uh, what I'm going to present today is basically part of a work in progress that I started um, on rethinking the concept of crisis um, and in, in politics but also in relation to the notions of empathy and borders. The initial questions I started with were whether the language of crisis can be redeemed if we speak of a crisis of empathy and political values with the resurgence of fascism in the, in the mainstream and the normalization of languages of violence, dehumanization, and exclusion. So what does the concept of crisis, when looked at through the lens of the so-called migration crisis, reveal? Why is crisis often imagined, produced, experienced, and feared during and after moments of mass popular uprisings? And can the language of crisis be redeemed, or is it inherently detrimental to any analysis of political and social phenomena? The concept of crisis, whether in economy, security, society, or other fields, has often been a driving force that shapes political discourse and policy across the world. In recent years, the so-called migration crisis or refugee crisis have in one way or another determined policy and politics in Europe, the US, but also in Lebanon, Turkey, and elsewhere. The debates around it coincide with attempts to further regulate the movement of undesirable bodies and have been a major drive for social cultural forces rallying around questions of integration, national identity, or safety, among other concerns voiced by those who imagine their privileges threatened by said crisis. The migration crisis, in this sense, is often taken for granted. It exists because everyone is talking about its existence, regardless of empirical proof. The assumption is that the crisis exists, that is, it is severe, and that it requires urgent solutions. In this intervention, I will try to deal with precisely this making, imagining, and construction of a migration, migration crisis or migration as crisis. And I want to relate that to the realities that were produced during and after the mass popular uprisings in the th southern and eastern Mediterranean and the rise of fascism in Europe and the US, among other places. While people in the West, mostly, but also elsewhere, produce and watch dystopian science fiction about walls, inequality, sadistic injustice, and the daily suffering of relatable characters, there is a curious blindness to the real-life examples happening every day to real people in proximity. Unfortunately, these real people rarely look like the stars on the screen. They are the brown bodies who are often the victims of the same systems that the producers and some of the audiences are part of, passively or actively. Here I can think of examples such as The Handmaid's Tale, The Hunger Games, Ender's Game, The 3% and many others. How are the images of migrants on the borders of Fortress Europe, the caged children separated from their parents on the US-Mexico borders, Australia's prison islands, uh, um, the, the Syrian refugee camps uh, f and freezing people in these refugee camps in Lebanon, different from those suffering in any of the mainstream dystopian films or series consumed consumed on the screens today. So how is it that caging children in the desert, drowning people in the sea, building walls and concentration camps, or designing impossible border policies, not as relatable to people as a well-produced TV series or a big budget movie? At a time when we, leave un uh, when we have unprecedented access to images and information, when we can see, often live, the brutality of humans and the injustices that plague our world, be it in the form of war, policing, or systematic destruction of the earth, out of many other examples, why is it that producers and audiences have such an appetite for dystopian science fiction and for politics of exclusion at the same time? And in some places, co this coincides with, politi with political apathy. As a consumer myself of both such productions and of news, these were some of the initial questions that motivated me to think of this text. They were a pers personal starting point and an attempt to move from a personal rant into a more public thinking exercise. In recent years, one of the most common political debates in Europe and the US, but also in Lebanon, Turkey, and other places, where refugees, uh, where refugees have passed and or settled, had to do with different iterations of the notion of a migration crisis. For several years now, this so-called crisis has determined policy and politics across both countries that have hosted refugees, but also countries of passage. 
In addition to that, it has been a major drive for sociocultural forces, talking about migration, national identity, and safety, as I mentioned. In public discourse, public uh, political debates, electoral campaigns, and in daily conversations, the migration crisis is one of the, mo the one that is taken for granted. Everyone is saying it exists, therefore it exists. The starting point of these debates is not whether it does exist, but the assumption that, uh, that it is severe and requires urgent debates and solutions. The certainty does not mean that the debates or even the conditions have, have been the same in all these locations, but that debates exist and are central in all these locations. Though some have attempted to demystify this crisis and speak of it in terms of numbers or empirical facts, little of these attempts have made it to the mainstream public uh, discourse, let alone dismantle the notion of crisis itself, sometimes even among those who are pro proponents of migration and refugees. In other words, the existence of the crisis is a given, and the debate is about, it, is about it is how to address it. In numbers, the migration crisis refers to at most 1% of the EU's 500 million inhabitants. In other words, the population of a city, but spread across the continent. <laughs> when it comes to numbers and empirical impact, the actual crisis is a small one. It consists of a, of a flow of humans, something that humans have been doing ever since they were able to move. Migration has been natural. People have migrated when there is danger, when there is need, when there is curiosity, or, when they, when, or simply when they could. If this human flow was not talked about as crisis, it would probably go unnoticed and more attention would be devoted to thinking about the violence that provoked the movement of these people. In other words, the issue is not about numbers, nor the capacity in this case. The crisis has to do with these migrant, who these migrants are, where they come from, and what they look like. It is precisely in the making of the migrant crisis that the actual crisis could be located. To find it, we must look at the conditions and reasons why a crisis is imagined, experienced, and feared in the first place, particularly in the countries where there is much abundance, wealth, and privilege compared to the rest of the world. It is therefore an ethical, political, and social one. On the one hand, the rise of fascism, or its resurfacing as an acceptable mainstream after having, having been supposedly dormant or hidden under the facade created by a few decades of rapid economic growth and major wealth accumulation, this accumulation has provided a very high quality of life for those who belong within the fortress at the expense of a miserable existence for most of those outside of it. It is a division between those who are born with the luxury, uh, the luxury of movement across borders, security and safety, and those who are confined by borders and exploitation. This crisis is also one of whiteness in some places or of privile privilege in, uh, in others. In other words, in some parts of the world, the migration crisis can be read as one of white fear, white fragility, faced with the terrifying thought that those privileges that have been normalized, that people grew up believing that they are entitled to, might one day be lost. In other places, it translates in other forms of exclusions, other fears that come from the idea of sharing resources or existing with others, or finding a vulnerable other that can be held responsible for all our problems, suffering, injustices, and, and so on. It is the crisis that normalizes segregation through policy making and through the acceptance, or at best the reluctant and weak rejection, of brutality against those seen as other, as lesser, as a threat, or as undeserving of our wealth and our privileges, or of even of safety and security so people would weigh the loss of privilege and the moral obligation. One story that I found remarkable was the story of a Malian, Malayan migrant who was granted French citizenship because he climbed a building to save a child. This story says a lot. It is celebration of the hero who, by accomplishing this feat, now deserves to be French, to join those who are heroic by birth. And it hides the reality that apart from this exception, migrants, he heroic or not, are undesirable bodies that are deported, imprisoned, or made to suffer on a daily basis. So what does it mean when a state is able to legalize the incarceration of toddlers or, at, or of purposefully making sure that people drowning in the sea trying to reach safety is an acceptable price to pay for our safety? What does it mean when millions support these policies and ask for more, when people establish organizations to drown boats carrying vulnerable migrants? to patrol borders and to stop those who dare cross them, or punish those who survive uh, the journey, or even to threaten those who make, make it to safety and hackle them or terrorize them. 
What we are witnessing today is an infuriating obscene contradiction between what humanity thinks of itself and what it actually does and is, between what is preached and what is practiced. History is rife with examples of dehumanization and brutality with logics that are not much different from those we, uh, we see today. Some lives become disposable for the leisure or comfort of others or for the convenience of holding, holding them responsible for our suffering or misfortune. The outrage about the Trump administration's dehumanization practice of separating families, seeking refuge at, and caging their children is ob obviously legitimate. However, the way it is expressed exposes some fundamental lacks in the discourse of crisis. This is not America. These are not our values. These are statements that place the practice in opposition to an imagined history of goodness, kindness, and national virtue. Today's brutality becomes a crisis, something that breaks a normal course of things where America was good, where such brutality did not exist. But this practice is neither new, nor does it contradict the history of the United States. Countless children, aside from adults, have suffered from American policies throughout history, from the genocide of the native peoples of the colonized continent, to slavery, up to the wars on communism, then terror. Children in Guatemala, Honduras, or elsewhere in Latin America suffer from American policies every day in their home countries. In the 90s, in Iraq, hundreds of thousands of children starved to death or were denied basic medication because of American policy. Today in Yemen and in Gaza, it is not so different as American weapons rain down on these devastated places. In Lebanon, refugees are held responsible for all evils, from the lack of electricity to the shortage of water, the economic crisis, pollution, forest fires, the shortage of US dollars in the country, the collapse of the public schooling system, traffic jams, traffic accidents, and any issue that has plagued the country for at least 30 years, though that is more than 20 years before the refugee, refugee, refugees even arrived. We get angry, sad, disgusted, shocked, appalled, but we should not be surprised. These practices are normalized by systems of belief, by an ethical framework that are made legitimate. Violence is legitimized by fear, but also by accepting that the lives of others are less worthy than losing one's privilege in an unjust world. In the West, the crisis can be read as a crisis of white privilege and the various ways in which violence against brown bodies is normalized, legitimized and enacted with a sense of moral superiority and entitlement. Elsewhere, the division takes other shapes, but follows the same logic of threatened identity, threatened resources, the need for a scapegoat, and so on. That is at the heart of every right-wing movement from Trump's Make America Great Again to the AfD in Germany, the Front National in France, Modi's India, Lebanon's Free Patriotic Movement, and the many, many other fascist movements that are on the rise. But meanwhile, we have also been witnessing movements of protest across the globe, globalization, informa information flows, and economic interconnection between different corners of the world have shifted the geography of power. Protest movements from Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, to Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Bahrain, to Thailand, Indonesia, South Korea, Hong Kong, Uganda, Nigeria, Sudan, South Africa, as well as the protests around Europe and North America, and most recently in Lebanon, Iraq, Algeria, Chile, and Haiti, among many, many more, have been quite uh, have something in common. At the core of these protests is a people or peoples and the relationship to power and the demand for access to resources concentrated in the hands of the few. This is not to say that there is a unified front or a homogeneous movement or even a shared ideology, but there is a line of power and a connection, contention of the modality of its exer exercise both in terms of rights and in terms of justice. <coughs> Migration, war or natural disasters passing by privatization the erosion of social welfare, the erosion of democracy and representation, to the environmental catastrophe are not isolated issues. They are not disconnected. They are networks of cause and effect, cycles of crisis, and a shared logic of exploitation and disconnection between power and its subjects are no longer sustainable, and they have reached a level of eruption. This is the moment when we can speak of a people or peoples, it is a starting point for any political thinking, and this is the moment when deconstructing the very notion of crisis can be crucial to the deconstruction of the systems of exclusion that feed on producing and instrumentalizing crisis in order to reproduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Last 
stimmt. Ja, also, ja. ja thanks so much. Uh, it's also uh, somehow the typicality that uh, we are very much working on uh, in the Bayani and what not only. And uh, my question is like, uh, it's not really, I also was asking uh, this, uh, like trying to, uh, to understand what is the position uh, also to, to the others, but. Um, it's not rather about drawing some uh, cheap parallels with the 30s or the 40s of the 20th century, right? But of course, uh, I mean, uh, what is in particular uh, in our uh, in the interest of why we are proposing this idea of the Middle East Europe is that basically a, a periphery or semi-periphery is basically the territory of a new apartheid, right? where a basic division a line is, uh, is between those who are in and who are out, mm -hmm. the included and the excluded, right? Mm -hmm. This is like as, uh, as traditional, but as new as we perceive it. But I'm actually thinking uh, of one very strange or rather weird phenomenon in, in, uh, in Europe, which is a kind of emergence uh, between anti-Semitism and uh, uh, and a rapophobic sentiment. So, uh, would you agree uh, that uh, basically this figure of a so-called illegal migrant became a kind of a new symbolic Jew in this uh, mainstream uh, discourse nowadays, in the mainstream political discourse? Because yeah, to, to some extent I totally agree with you that uh, basically you c we can say that uh, there is no far right anymore, right? Because it's now in the political mainstream center. So in this sense, what, what is your take on, on this kind of strange emergence that uh, this illegal migrant usually uh, from, from Arab countries because of the wars and so on is playing uh, the role of uh, what uh, usually uh, was uh, a Jew, a figure of a Jew um, uh, traditionally in, in the 20th century Europe. Like even the case that you mentioned that in, like in Lebanon but also elsewhere that also in the uh, Eastern Europe as well, like migrants are, or these refugees are guilty for everything. We can blame them for, be just because uh, they're an easy to, uh, scapegoat to channel social frustration and political ressentiment. So, uh, of course, again, I'm uh, emphasizing this. It's not about drawing this cheap parallel mm -hmm. that is, uh, again, like the 30s, but what kind of uh, development or prospect of this strange emergence you can envision? Could you please develop? Because I'm really, it's a question for myself as well. Yeah. I mean, one thing is like, I think, I mean, there's lots of people who have done this parallel between like the rise of uh, like Islamophobia today with like compared to the figure of the Jew uh, before. And I think there is like, it, there is a lot of uh, truth in this. Um, there are different, I mean, some parallels are actually interesting enough is the reemergence of like literally in in the in caricatures for instance that you would see in, in ad in political campaigns that like drawings of the arab are actually like almost exactly the same as the drawings of the jew in the in, in the 20s and the 30s so you like literally have the same stereotypes um the other thing i think like one important parallel to to keep in mind is that like what like the figure of the jew was basically fun foundational for the like creation of this European identity that is like pure and and like uh, the national identity of of being European and Christian in that, in that sense, and I think that like and, and and today when when we talk about and that's not only in Europe I, I think like when we talk about any notion of um, a system or or a certain like power that's trying to um, keep it or reproduce itself has been like based on a lot of resurgence. I, I, I don't even want to say resurgence, like a, a, a presence of uh, a crisis of, of uh, identity, of like how to redefine who is part of this uh, inclusion or, uh, and exclusion, not only in Europe. In Lebanon, we are excluded. We are part of the exclusion when it comes to Europe, but we are the inclusion when it comes to Syria, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so you have this like figure that, that that has to play this role again in the and, and it coincides always with the rise of of uh, a very exclusive and very uh, fascist uh, national identity um i think i don't know if that like if that that uh, that yeah, answers yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
I have a comment on that too, because we had for several years, we had a program also, or a project on, it was called Jewish Islamic Hermeneutics as a Cultural Critique. One of the central objectives of that program, of that project was uh, to bring uh, scholars, or Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars, scholars of those traditions together in conversation about the politicization uh, of religion. So at one instance, a European Jewish scholar made this connection between Islamophobia and um, anti-Semitism. It was completely rejected by the Muslim participants mm. who, say, who said, uh, uh, from especially from South Africa, interestingly, who said, uh, we don't need this comparison. This is a European comparison. Mm. It's a comparison of the past. It, in fact, it's a repetition yeah. of the the kind of reinsertion of European experiences in the rest of the world. Because, for example, I mean, yeah. and another occasion, for example, was this dis dispute, interestingly, between an Ashkenazi and, an, uh, and an Oriental Jew. The Oriental Jew said this figure of the wandering <coughs> rootless Jew is a, it's a particular story of Europe. Perhaps it was uh, somehow universal, universalized because uh, some people argue Let's, let's say particular trends or streams of uh, Western European political thought were always defined over the body of the Jew. So mm -hmm. this is perhaps, perhaps there is this link in the translation of uh, certain Western or forms of uh, political theory or organization that were thought out in Germany or France or Italy were translated elsewhere. Perhaps this was thought, but I think the Lebanese, they don't need a Jew to be racist. It probably has to do that uh, the, the Holocaust was a European phenomenon. That's why it was universalized. And it's mm. like this particular dimension of the, uh, this figure of the Jew. Perhaps. I mean, this is a sensitive topic, for example, in Germany, of course. But uh, I think the Armenians, for example, they say this is the first uh, genocide. Uh, other people may claim there's their very first. Yeah. Uh, Ian Buruma was in an article I read 10 years ago, was writing about this um, this, ra this Olympic race for victimhood. It's not, he didn't, uh, he was not cynical about the victims, but <coughs> he was uh, problematizing, you know, this idea to, to base, uh, you know, too many things on on communities of victimhood uh, that are influenced, of course, by the preference, for example, some, and some, some people in some countries give to particular groups of victims on the expense of others. Uh, one of our fellows from Turkey, he, he said something very uh, uh, smart, I think, on German television when the German parliament recognized uh, the Armenian genocide. You know, he said, you know, what does it matter to cry about the past if one is blind uh, to the present? Uh, so this is, I think, a very foundational critique of, um, you, know, you know, too much trying to expose these models. I am also sometimes skeptical about uh, Islamophobia in this discourse in Germany uh, because uh, first it divides, uh, it's my personal opinion because I'm not a Muslim, I'm, all, I'm from a Christian family, so I'm also exposed sometimes to racism, but why is racism only a problem of the Jews and the Muslims? Of course, at the same time, I'm privileged through my education and through my income, more so than whites and white people are. So why, is, should, mm. why should we stick to models of collective vi victimhood? Mm. And because that camouflages, I think, uh, also the social problems and other real life problems that lie behind the mobilizations of racism and its uh, brothers. <laughs> but we have more. We can have them. The next speaker. No? Thank you, Vali. Now we will come uh, to the real madness. Melania <laughs> <laughs> Mornier is uh, also currently a fellow of our uni program. She's a medical anthropologist, holds a PhD in anthropology and social work. 
Uh, she works on a book project about global mental health at the periphery, a social history of psychiatry, humanitarianism, and violence in Lebanon from 1860 to 2012. Her talk today will be on women's patients of institutional psychiatry, madness, and their society in Lebanon. Yes, uh, thank you so much um, for sticking around for the fourth uh, talk. Thank you, Vasil, for the invitation. A very special thank you for Jessica Metz, who is part of our UMI team and who organizes our lives every day <laughs> uh, in Ukraine and in Berlin. Um, so the title of my talk is Women Patients uh, of uh, Institutional Psychiatry, Madness, Gender, and Society in Lebanon. And my intervention will address uh, the relationship of psychiatry to power and the processes of psychiatrization or the processes of psychologization that occurs over anxieties during times of social transfer, uh, transformations or during war, uh, political upheavals. I look at this relationship in Lebanon uh, as a peripheral modern site. We talked a little bit about peripherals yesterday, but the way I think of Lebanon is uh, a site uh, that is on the periphery, but it's still a modern site that can incorporate um, and engage with and create new forms of expertise or manipulate new forms of expertise, uh, new forms of knowledge practices like psychiatry. So my work in general has looked at the political implications of different psychiatric projects in Lebanon during national development and also during political violence and war. Um, some of these projects that I looked at, for example, were the difficulties that psychiatrists uh, faced uh, when f uh, trying to find war trauma in Lebanon during the civil war, but also during the different Israeli wars in 1982 and 2006, whereas in Israel you'll find an abundance amount of war trauma within the, the uh, the civilians and the soldiers. So I was looking, I looked at the politics of uh, suffering in Lebanon and the problem of uh, the absence of war trauma in Lebanon, what does that uh, entails politically. I also looked at the use of hysteria and personality disorders, for example, in post-war Lebanon and the way in which these diagnoses were used to reconfigure a new um, cleansed uh, post-war subject. Uh, but for this particular talk, I will specifically address the relationship between women and institutional psychiatry in Lebanon. So recently, in 2017, the anti-racism movement, ARM, a grassroots collective created by young feminist activists in Lebanon in, col in collaboration with migrant workers, published an article in, in an issue on psychiatry and feminism prepared by two feminist collectives and organizations, Sotin Niswa, which means Women's Voice, and Mashra al-Alif, uh, the A Project. So the article was entitled Migrant Women Workers in Psychiatric Hospitals, Mental Illness or Racist Diagnosis. It described cases of battered migrant um, women workers, domestic workers. Uh, in Lebanon, there's a, a lot of influx of labor from uh, places like Ethiopia, like Philippines, Nepal. Um, so this article uh, talked about uh, specific cases of battered migrant domestic workers work in, in the domestic sphere, admitted into psychiatric hospitals by their employers against their will, many of them diagnosed with psychosis and many of them remained there. Migrant domestic workers in Lebanon are bound by a racist sort of a labor network called, uh, we call the kafala system, is the sponsorship system. Uh, this sort of uh, uh, labor network strips them from their rights. They take their passports away from them, for example, and they expose them to an incredible amount of vulnerability and violence. In the article, the movement asks several questions concerning the relationship between non-Lebanese uh, non-white non women and psychiatric institutionalization in Lebanon. So what is the role of these hospitals in uh, incarcerating uh, the, uh, these women? Um, another example, sorry for the pictures, um, is from February of this year, 2019, where a Lebanese woman wrote a Facebook post that quickly became a matter of mediatized and public opinion uh, that was debated over the next few weeks. The woman wrote about her visit to the patients of al Fanar Hospital, a hospital for psychological and mental disorders in South Lebanon. She described her shock and dismay at the sight of the rundown hospital, the dirt on the floors and walls, the lack of heating, lack of clean water to bathe, scarcity of food and medication for the patients, who seem to be living in very miserable conditions. Um, and then the woman says, we were truly shocked um, uh, when we went to the women's floor. Some of the women ran to us uh, to complain and cry. One woman said that she was not insane, but wanted our help to get out of this place. Another woman spoke of, about how her parents got rid of her because of her unwanted looks. 
Another woman said she was dumped here by her stepfather and an Armenian young girl who did not know why she was there and begged for us to save her. And so many others, each of them had a similar story." End quote. Um, so you can see by now that my work is on the borderlines of psychiatric institutions. So which women end up uh, in these kinds of institutions? And I feel like this is also a universal story. It's not just about Lebanon. Anyone who was diagnosed or entered into kind of an institutionalization, any woman, knows the thin line between going so about being mad and being normal. And the second question is, who remains there for good? Who, who is able to get out and who isn't? So these two examples show us an, um, a glimpse, and I can tell you other um, sort of stories, uh, of an emergent discourse by feminists and by the public questioning the incarceration and incarceration of women in psychiatric institutions today. It also reveals a strong process of psychologization. So the presence of psychiatry in Lebanon is very also predominant as a way of regulating normality, as a way of regulating war, as a way of regulating many things, as we will see. But in this case, um, it's an expertise, intervention, diagnosis of women's bodies, women's desires, and women's behaviors. It's a specific kind of gendered regulation that psychiatry is playing in Lebanese society. So in my talk, I, at I will attempt to contextualize and historicize this relationship while maintaining the argument that the problem of institutionalizing women in psychiatric hospitals today is not a problem of a decaying psychiatric um, uh, project. So if we think of institutional psychiatry as th this time when um, um, you had hospitals only, so hospitals for the insane or hospitals that were only done for uh, mad people or for uh, mentally uh, disordered people, this is a decaying project everywhere in the world. It is used differently in different kinds of powers. Um, but my argument is that this is happening in Lebanon not because this is a decaying project and people are ending, ending up there, um, and I will try to show this to you by taking, um, looking at this relationship in the 1950s, at a time when institutional psychiatry in Lebanon was at its peak. It was a flourishing kind of a treatment, a very modern and, uh, a promise to re liberate um, uh, um, people from their suffering. So I focus in my talk on one hospital. Um, it was called the Lebanon Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorders. We call it in Lebanon Asfuriye Hospital. Um, it was the name of the land that the hospital was established on. Asfuri was an institution founded by a Protestant Quaker missionary, Theophilus Waldmeyer. It was meant to be a humane asylum for the insane at the beginning of 1901, uh, and, but it also introduced modern psychiatry into the region. Um, uh, the institution followed British-style psychiatry. Uh, it attracted patients from all over the place in Lebanon and in um, various uh, Arab countries, but also in Malta and Greece in the earlier times. There was a medical mig migration to uh, Asfuriye Hospital, and this is probably why uh, the name Asfuriye became very popular in the Arab world to signify something resembling a generic madhouse. So if you ask anyone what does Asfuriye mean today, they will tell you it means um, a, a, a hospital for the insane, but they wouldn't remember this particular hospital. Um, uh, the name is also used in songs, in novels, in political discourses. When we talk about a bad political crisis, we say the, the country is like Asfuri, you know, so it's like a big mad, mad, madhouse. Um, the hospital closed its doors uh, in 1983, following the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. It was bombed a little. I mean, it has its own story of why it closed. But in this hospital, I will tell you the story of one woman patient who arrived there in the 1950s. Her name was Huda. Huda was a 34-year-old uh, woman from Halab, from Aleppo in Syria. She was admitted by her sister into the third and poorest uh, class level of the hospital in 1957, despite the fact that she came from a, from a wealthy family. At the time, in the late 50s, Asfuri Hospital um, had overseen many medical, technological, and infrastructural developments. And you can see here the rise of institutional psychiatry. Um, in the lower picture, for example, is um, the emergence of occupational therapy, which was huge in the 1950s in Lebanon. Um, within these institutions, you can see the promise of institutional psychiatry is that uh, whoever goes into this hospital has to learn a certain kind of skill. So when they are released, uh, they can go back into society. So there was always this idea that people have to go back um, um, into society. And to, uh, these, this hospital was not a hospital that meant to leave that, that meant for these their patients for them to stay. Uh, despite this institutional growth that we see, Hoda managed to escape the hospital in 1958, uh, like many of the patients throughout the existence of the hospital, but she was forced to return again. 
She was shortly released to, uh, to her family with a note on her file that said that she has not been cured, yet she is cooperative. However, less than a month later, Huda's brother-in-law brings her back again, and she's uh, readmitted again, this time for good. Um, both of her parents had passed away when she was young. So Huda's illness narrative, um, what Arthur Kleinman coins as the patient's own complex and phenomenological story of illness, is completely narrated upon her first admission by her own sister. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing you the yeah, pictures uh, of the hospital in the 1957 with different expertise, different skills uh, going on in the hospital. So upon her admission, it is uh, Huda's sister that speaks to the hospital's admission attendants and to the psychiatric nurses on Huda's behalf. She tells them in great details about her personality, her sexuality, her behaviors, her desires, and her abnormal overall abnormalities. The sister tells Huda's illness narrative in Arabic, while the psychiatric nurse directly translates it into English into the patient record file, which was the official la language of the hospital. The nurses, are, the nurses also engaging in another translating, a translation of Huda's story, and she's translating it into a clinical narrative that can easily be classified within the hospital's own system. As her patient record shows, Huda's chief complaint was an abnormal sexual tendency for 10 years since she was 24 years old. In the patient record, Huda is described as very bright. She did very well in primary and middle school, but she was abnormally studious, reading many books that were outside of her studies, being probably about sex. The main reason behind Huda's abnormalities was a young man who proposed to her, but her father refused based on economic reasons. Huda had already had sex with the man, and following her refusal, her father's refusal, she became suddenly very inhibited in her talk about sex and started to tell people that she would very much like to marry many men and have relations with many men because each man would be different and would give her a different kind of pleasure. And when that man, the man who wanted to marry her, married someone else, Huda went to his house, cursed him, and covered his front door with dirt. She then started going out with different men and presumably having sex with them because her sister would see her coming home late at night. Huda liked to talk about sexual experiences publicly and about her sexual, the sexual pleasure that she get from these different men. This is really the story that we learned about Huda from her patient record file. The psychiatric nurse writes, the patient practiced most of what she said and wished until she became the talk of the town. She is now brought to the hospital despite herself and was told that this is a maternity unit where her sister has given birth to a baby." End quote. Huda is then given two diagnoses, uh, one for her sexuality, nymphomania, which is a diagnosis of an over-sexualized over woman, uncontrollable sexual desire, and schizophrenia. Schizophrenia was given based on the following remark in her file. Patient is very suspicious that her sister has brought her to a mental hospital. She looks anxious, but with a stupid smile on her face. No memory defects, hallucinations or delusions, no insight into her problem, end quote. The diagnosis is then confirmed by a psychiatrist at the same day who recommends uh, sedatives and ECT electroconvulsive uh, treatment, usual treatments for the late 1950s at the time. One of Huda's disorders, nymphomania, will disappear from her chart for the year, in the years to come, while schizophrenia will become her main diagnosis that requires her to be placed on different psychotropic medications that kept changing in nature and intensity. By the time Huda was admitted, and this is also um, uh, pictures of the hospital. You see at the lower end is where probably Huda would hang out is in the woman wards, the man, the man wards with, um, in the uh, upper picture. And on the upper right picture is the uh, psychiatric social worker. So you see the extension of the hospital to, the, to society in the late 1950s and the interest, in, um, again, in the institutional psychiatry to bring these patients back. And then the cafeteria. So by the time Huda arrived uh, to, and was admitted, sexuality represented one of the new domains of psychiatry, uh, psychiatric scrutiny at the hospital, joining other forms of everyday and social pathologies that I was able to find, like marriage, like inability to get married, specific kinds of manhood, so like the oversensitive man, crime, labor, uh, the inability to get a job, war, disability, and also a lot of drug addiction as well. All of these, uh, I mean, regulating drug addiction. All of these categories now under treatment at the hospital represented a transformation in institutional psychiatry from a discipline that focused only on the insane to a discipline equally concerned with normality, also focusing on normal people and their everyday problems, dysfunctions, deviations, sexuality, behaviors, desires, etc. 
Despite the fact that the diagnosis uh, of nymphomania was slowly dropped from Huda's patient record, it was replaced completely with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, Huda's sexuality and desire remained to be the abnormality that was to be meticulously observed and regulated at the hospital on a daily basis, as the nurses and the psychiatrists kept records of when Huda spoke with the man patients, whether she harassed them a, a little or a lot, what she told them, her daily behavior, the amount of time she cursed in a week, the amount of time she was going to occupational therapy, which was the promise to her release, where she learned every day how to bake, um, and so on. So this was my first point, that the sexuality became a, a matter of scrutiny. And the second point that Huda's story reveals to us about the relationship between women and psychiatry is an intricate explanation of how and why some women end up in Lebanon, end up in, a, in the hospital, becoming permanent patients there. And what is the slight difference between going in and out and becoming a permanent patient there? This point is best illustrated by Huda herself. Throughout her stay in, in the hospital in Asfuriye, Huda wrote to her siblings twice. Both letters were never sent, but were placed in her, at the end of her patient record file, and I was able to read them. They provide us with an insight into Huda's own voice and own story. So the first, what we heard the first time was her clinical record, so it's not really Huda's voice, but this is Huda's voice that we can hear in these letters. The first letter written early on is addressed to her brothers, in a very coherent, agentive, and strategic voice, Huda negotiate her release from the hospital by suggesting to her brothers numerous ways in which she can return to society and assume acceptable gender roles. She could become a maid uh, in her brother's house. Uh, she could, um, uh, and serve them from uh, day to night. She could learn the dactylo, the typewriter, and join the woman uh, labor force in Syria. She could become a housewife and even get married and even become a mother. Huda also pleads based on her own uh, class status, reminding her brother that Papa, their father, had paid a lot of money for their educations. How can they then sleep uh, peacefully when they have locked her with the mad people, when they know she's neither sick nor crazy? I know why I'm in this hospital, Huda says. It's because you want to take my inheritance that my father has left me, and you wanted to consider me dead, and you in this way you inherit me quite quickly. In the letter, Huda pleads one last time, now based on kinship and family relations. I am not, uh, I am your sister, I am not a slut or a prostitute. I demand, I strongly demand my freedom, Huda says. Huda then writes a letter 17 years later, this time addressed to her sister, um, the same sister whose husband admitted her the second time. Now a case of chronic schizophrenic and a cooperative uh, patient, Huda is somewhat incoherent and her sense of self appears as chattered. The difference between both letters is striking and heartbreaking. She showers her sister with loving words and prayers. You have changed, she tells her. Ever since you gave birth to your last child, your voice and speech is not the same anymore. Maybe you have a woman this, this, the disease. Maybe you have something. Maybe you should come here to the hospital. There are many smart doctors here who will give you medications and needles, and you can stay for one or two weeks, and they will care for you, and then you, your husband, and children can take me out with you. Again, Huda tries to negotiate a useful, productive, and proper social place in her society but 17 years later. So she says, I can work in the kitchen, I can be a maid, I can take care of your kids. Um, but she also tells her sister to be locked in here depends entirely on family, not on the doctors. If the family wants us to get out of the hospital, then we will get out. And if they want us to stay, then they will let us stay. They, they will keep us locked here. If the parents, yeah. So Huda's letters presents us with another narrative outside of the clinical frame. From her constant negotiation uh, with her siblings, what becomes clear is the authority of the family itself in defining what is normal and pathological over that of psychiatry, and even within the boundedness of the psychiatric hospital itself. But not only that, it shows the tension between, what I think is a tension between psychiatry and society in Lebanon, or to put it more differently, the tension between the psychiatric promise of reforming, of transforming mad subjects, and mad women in this case, um, and the mad as seen by society and family as we need to push them outside of society and outside of the family. So here Michel Foucault's work, for example, on modernity and modern science assumes a reconfiguration of the power on, different, on all the different levels of institutions. So on the level of the family, of the school, of the prisons, of the psychiatric institutions, of the factories. And they all lead to one form of subjectification, disciplined subjectification. Huda, as a permanent resident of Asfuriye, maybe tells us something else, that the cultural authority of psychiatry does not always coincides and predicts the same kind of subject as the authority of family and society. 
After all, as Huda says, it's the family who decides who can leave Asfuri, not the hospital administration, nor the psychiatrist. Huda is referring here specifically to the chronic cases of the hospital, those who have already spent so much time being institutionalized that they became Asfuri's own, the hospital's own people. Convincing the family, not the psychiatrist, that she, should, she could be a productive labored force in Syria, a proper housewife or a maid for her brothers and sister was the only way to be released from the hospital and not through occupational therapy. It seemed almost banal. Yeah. The issue of inheritance also uh, suggests the possible intentional incarceration of Huda, highlighting the materiality of the social and legal death by permanent uh, patients of, of the hospital. The social legal death of women brought by their permanent institutionalization is made possible in the absence of a protective patriarchal fa figure, in this case, Huda's father, and by other threatening male fig kinship figures in the family, like the brother-in-law and the brothers. In the hospital, the, patients, the family's refusal to claim back their sister and, um, and to push, push her back again into the hospital is now translated into turning Huda's diagnosis from schizophrenia to chronic case of schizophrenia. This, for me, is, works as a bureaucratic concept used to communicate the permanent stay of a patient in this hospital and to start to negotiate financial coverage for her stay forever, really. So permanent patients, those who are not given a way back into society, were discussed and debated by the medical directors and psychiatrists in the hospital as they presented an economic burden on the hospital and most importantly revealed the limitations and failures of the promise of modern institutional psychiatry in treating and reforming these social pathologies back into society. The problem was so big that at one point uh, there was a plan for a cemetery on the grounds of the hospital as early as 1908, so seven years after it opened. And then in 1920, to be able to bury all the unclaimed residents who spent their lives at the hospital. Huda was one of these permanent patients who was never able to go back home. However, we know, we know of, of uh, thankfully we know, we know of at least two women who actually managed to escape this impossible situation. Both of them are quite famous, one much more than the other. Um, one is the, uh, the very, f I mean, for us famous, Maizyede. Maizyede is uh, an Arab, um, feminist, intellectual, poet, writer, translator. She took part of uh, what we call Arab Nahda, so the Arab uh, modernity, uh, at the time when there was a lot of um, a rise in women's rights and feminist rights, etc. And she was one of, uh, one of the outspoken um, uh, uh, feminists. So it's really ironic that someone like her will end up in the same hospital, in the Asfuri hospital in 1936. Uh, she was admitted there by her cousin because of also of inheritance uh, issues, but also because of weird, bizarre behaviors. The second one is much less um, famous. She's a public figure. She's an actress, Darina al -Jundi. She's also a writer. She wrote about how she was forcibly admitted in 1996, dragged from her hair by her brother-in-law because of a loose sexuality and a religious blasphemy at her father's funeral the same day. Huda's uh, case echoes uh, very strongly in both of these stories in the past and today, uncovering specific trends within the relationship of women to institutional psychiatry, sexuality, transgression of gender roles, either small or uh, big. And we, if you're interested of my Zidi, we can talk about her as well. Uh, I mean, I'll talk a little bit. Protective uh, or threatening patriarchal kinship and also inheritance. So Mai Ziedi, the famous intellectual, would have to do a public lecture at the American University of Beirut, a very un, um, uh, prestigious organization in Beirut, demonstrating her intellect, her poise, her ability to be in, so in society as an intellectual in order for her to get released from the hospital. The lecture was made uh, possible after a raging public debate about the role of, of the hospital in incarcerating women in the late 1930s. The lecture was attended by the psychiatrist himself, who then declares her sane. Darina al Jundika had to convince her mother to release her 20 days after her stay. She told me that uh, one woman patient in the hospital, it's called Deir Salid, told her that she was lucky. If her family would have arrived a week or so later, Darina would have had a much harder time returning to society. It seems that the longer you stay, the harder it is to go back to society, even if you want to. Psychiatric institutions are a confined place where women also followed specific rules um, uh, roles and norms that were ontologically different from those of the social. Yet, as Huda's case shows, women patients of psychiatric institutions were not only governed by psychiatry within the walls and wards of the institution, but also by social relations of power shaped by kinship, by gender, gendered kinship and patriarchy and family. So to conclude very quickly, 
Um, the case of Huda contributes to current debates and conversations around the relationship between women and psychiatry in Lebanon today. And these are some of the work that is produced around this relationship. I'll just talk in the middle is also a graphic novel by a friend who a feminist, Pascal Ghazali, who was also interested in revealing the story of Maïs Yede, the, the woman intellectual we just talked about, as a way to heal, as a, um, as a way for feminist movement in Lebanon to heal from the traumas of all these women being incarcerated. And so she goes on a sort of search, trying to imagine what, uh, where and what uh, happened to, to Maïs Yede. Um, so we can see these debates emerging within academic, feminist, and literary circles, many of which rely on Maizyede as a representative example of this relationship. These debates, if anything, uh, show an interest in tracing the history of psychiatry as a crucial endeavor for understanding the governance of women in Lebanon today. Reading the cases of migrant domestic workers, Lebanese feminist intellectual, Lebanese actress, Syrian girl from Aleppo, Armenian girl, etc., reading them all together shows the story, that the story of the cultural authority of psychiatry is fraught and complex. It is, its story is not only a story of social control, because that would be a very easy story to tell, nor is it a story of psychiatric sci only a story of psychiatric science and science making. What's at stake is more of a complex interplay or a tension or sometimes a fusion between the psychiatrization and the socialization of women subjects that calls for more study and critique. Um, yeah, I'll conclude here. Thank you. I think what that's my impression of uh, what uh, we've heard. That I mean, it started with a kind of reminder to something uh, like universal solidarity expressed by people who are usually not considered to be part of national history that has its special weight in a country like Egypt. And then I think this trope was also continued in Russia's uh, presentation that didn't dwell on like what Arabs write about you know, <coughs> Arab uh, miseries, but how, how in a particular genre that is not the book or not the, the newspaper commentary, uh, people try to make um, sense about it. And somehow it's a display also of empathy, I think, uh, also in different terms than all this news and facts that are part of this global or this, this digital stream that is one focus of this uh, Biennale. I think Lamia also showed a, a, a very interesting case of how, how to dig out individual histories uh, of, of persons in relations to ideas about freedom, individual freedom in a society, like and that Walid also addressed this point of racism in Lebanon. So one common thing is also that n none of the four speakers employs any form of post-colonial attitude that reduces uh, kind of community of southerners or easterners to be a kind of eternal object of oppression. So this is both, I think these are the both uh, facets uh, that uh, combine the talk. So but perhaps I start with this question, how does your work relate to what you experience in Lebanon now? Lamia. <laughs> or Walid? <laughs> 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 I mean, so in my case, I think it's, I don't know, so in my case, it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. I work in journalism and I work in, on, on politics and mostly on protest movements, so um, it was like, but it, 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 I mean, it was a kind of obvious connection and obvious influence, but um, the, the, what was not expected is that like, uh, it, my, like the inability to be able to write about it uh, easily, um, as easy, uh, like, so like kind of, it took me un like, uh, until I came back, I, I, until I left Beirut to be able to write an article about Beirut, I couldn't like, deal, like, uh, deal with actually analyzing anything when I was there. But that's, I think that's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Maybe it was a silly question, but I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how to answer it, but I don't know what, what you are <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, the thinking about uh, the relationship of women to psychiatry is a feminist question, and 
this is where my political engagement is, is with like feminist movements in Lebanon and the rest of the Arab countries, I guess. We can, yeah, you can ask questions too. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah, for, for example, or to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Maybe you can develop like more on this uh, point that you <coughs> made about a psychotic moment that we are currently in. What, in terms of the political realm, as I understood, right? Yeah, I mean, in the, there's, in the, there's all these uh, psychiatric sort of cultural critiques that we were living in a depression, in a moment mm -hmm. of uh, in a depression, and then it became a moment of anxiety, so we're all anxious, stress, and we all have to, you know, we have anxiety, etc. This is my own personal, mm -hmm. yani. and I was thinking about that wha after I replied, that maybe it's because we're coming from, yani, in times of uh, social uh, uprising and social unrest, what you see all the time is psychosis, and we've been, I've been thinking about that for, for a while now. Um, and so basically when the society splits, it's a split of consciousness that creates some sort of a new thing. So the idea that psychosis, I mean, there's many works that have been done on psychosis, uh, the way I talked about in, my f in, the, in the introduction of my paper. So um, understanding people and uh, like black men in the United States in the 60s, uh, black women in Lebanon, let's say, as a psychotic is a, a commentary that you are not we don't understand what you're saying, you, we don't understand why you're so angry or why you're screaming or why you talk this way. So there's this kind of engagement in psychosis. But I feel like if we're talking about social psychosis, it's also, it's a way to open a political imaginary, I feel, in a certain way. It's um, looking at social psychosis opens a way for you, I think it opens new possibilities. I'm still trying to, I mean, it's my own, personal observations, I'm still trying to think through this uh, idea. The Middle, Middle East, East Europe. Middle East yeah, Europe. the Middle East Europe uh, somehow maybe it goes back uh, to the um, beyond the idea of uh, Christian Europe that just a very recent concept, mm. uh, for example, in Alexandria and uh, the connection between Odessa, that region, and Alexandria, it could be traced back uh, towards the pre Christian and the early. Christian uh, era that um, and Marcel, for example, like the southern, like the sea borders. So might might that be like a decolonial way to sort of reinstate those peripheral, uh, so to say, connections uh, uh, in that would be beyond the um, like regional centers. But then again, your Forum Transregionale is located very much in the center, which in Berlin one could argue. So, no, I don't know, but uh, one interesting. So we had one interesting discussion too with uh, two uh, historian, no, historian from Poland and the Ukraine and the sociologist from Poland about the question why Eastern Europe is absent from any debates about world history, world literature. This was one question because, because we assumed so Eastern Europe is not Western enough and it's not Eastern or Southern enough to be and have any significant role in all this debate between 
the colonial and the post-colonial. Eh? And then the second uh, question was uh, why or what role would something like or place something like global history or world literature in a society like Poland or, or the Ukraine? Is there something uh, like this? No? But like in other discussions, the discussion was something else. It was an attack by this Polish sociologist on post-colonial theory. Referring to a young government. 